Welcome back to our intermediate financial accounting class. In the last few segments, we've been talking about EPS and all the different pieces that go into calculating basic and diluted EPS on our income statement. After going through the specific calculations of EPS and talking about convertible securities and diluted securities and how they create this diluted EPS number that allows investors to see what would happen if everybody who could get stock did get stock, what would happen to my ownership? We started talking about the journal entries. What happens if they do actually decide to use their stock options or to convert their preferred stock or convert their bonds? And that's what we've been working on in the last couple of segments are the journal entries that go along with these convertible or dilutive securities. In our last segment, we specifically looked at Sally's compensation expense. She got a set of equity options and we figured out that those options would give her about $6,000 in profit. That was our best guess on what she would earn using those options later on. That's what that fair value means. We're gonna divide that over the four years she has to work for us to earn them. And then we would make this journal entry down here for four years. And we stopped there because we need to take a minute to talk about the deferred tax consequences of this set of four journal entries recording the compensation expense. You see, under GAAP, we're required to divvy this fair value up over the years that she earns it. Under tax purposes, I can't get a tax break for this compensation expense I'm giving her until she actually exercises the options. Now, this is a temporary difference because under GAAP, I'm going to record $6,000. Under tax, I'm going to record $6,000. So it's a timing difference, not an amount difference, which means it leads to a deferred tax issue. So let's take a look at how this would fall out in our deferred tax calculations. First off, we'd start by calculating income before taxes. So before we granted the options, let's just say that our income from continuing operations before taxes was $100,000. We increase compensation expense, that's that debit, 1,500. We increase the expense, which drops our income from continuing operations. So we're now down to 98,500. Step two would be removing permanent differences. We're just going to ignore that for this example, but we could certainly put those numbers in here. Then we get to step three, and the number's already in here, but we're going to draw our graph since it's so important. For gap purposes, I'm showing an expense of $1,500 for each of the first four years. For tax purposes, the tax is zero because I can't get a tax break until she uses them. So to go to from negative 1500 to zero is a $1,500 adjustment. And you can see that right down here. So you'll notice the net effect of this on taxable income is negligible. It doesn't change it at all. I subtract up here, I add down here, doesn't change my taxes payable. Where we do see a change is when we get into step five. Step four, we multiply by a tax rate. We don't have that information, so we won't worry about it. But in step five, I would create a deferred tax table. And you can see, again, with step five, calculating the deferred tax, we're only looking at future years. So I'm in year one, so I'm only looking at years two, three, and four when she keeps earning the options. And then in year five, when we think she'll use them. So there's the two, three, and four, that 1,500, the rest of the 6,000 divvied up over these last three years. And then there's the 6,000 we'll use. We multiply by the tax rate. I just kept it constant. So we end up with a total deferred tax of $450. Now, is that a deferred tax asset or liability? Well, hopefully you look at that number and you say, oh, it's positive, that's a debit, the way this table works. But if we go back, we think we should be getting a discount of $1,500 and we're not getting it. So from a gap perspective, I'm paying more in tax than I should have to pay, like a prepaid expense. So it's a deferred tax asset. That's just what I want. And that's just what I see. Now that I have that, I can do step six, which is to put it into a T account. So I want to end at 450. I'm at zero. So to get from zero to 450 means I need a debit of 450, which leads me to this journal entry. I debit deferred taxes and I would reduce income tax expense. Why income tax expense? Because I just figured out, remember back here, that there's no change in income tax payable. I have a negative 1500 here, a positive 1500 here. The net effect is zero. So the tax payable amount is not going to change. So the only difference is to my deferred taxes 
and to the plug figure, income tax expense. And this same adjustment would end up being made each year for four years. So there's my year one, year two, year three, year four. If you were to delete years two, three, and four and do those calculations, you'd see that we end up with a debit of $1,800. All these tax breaks that I think I should have gotten and haven't yet. So I have this big deferred tax asset. So when you record an equity option, this is what's happening to your deferred taxes. It's only going to affect the deferred tax and the expense. It's not going to affect your payable at all. Pretty cool, huh? Now that we've talked about our taxes, it's time to get back to our journal entries. We have three journal entries that we want to do. We'll start with the exercise. Four letter word in my house. I'm sorry, you can tell by my shape. Exercise is not that high on my priority list. My wife keeps telling me I should get in shape. I keep telling her round is a shape, but she's not She's not buying it. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll work it out someday. If she gets up the money to exercise these options, we're going to get cash from her for that full strike price. So I'm going to start with a debit to cash, 1,000 options. Strike price was $8, so she's going to need to give me $8,000. In addition, I need to get rid of my additional paid in capital stock options outstanding because they're not outstanding anymore. So additional paid in capital stock option outstanding. And we've been putting $1,500 a year in there for four years. So there's that $6,000 that was our original fair value. At this point, I'm giving her stock. If I'm giving her stock, then the journal entry is just like any other issuance of stock. I take the number of shares times the par value, which in this case is $3 a share. So into my common stock account, I'm gonna put $3,000 and the balance is gonna to go to additional paid in capital common stock. So my plug figure here, I've got eight plus six minus three, $11,000. This is the issue of 1,000 shares for employee stock options. And this is the happiest of the options, no pun intended, where she actually gets to use the options that she earned. Now, sometimes, unfortunately, it doesn't get to this point where they can use the options. Sometimes we lose the employee and if they quit before their options vest, then the options just go away. And the rule with a loss of options, they didn't make it through the end of the service period, they quit or they passed away or whatever reason, then what we do is we reverse the previous entries. So I'm going to debit additional paid in capital, stock options, outstanding. and credit compensation expense. I'm just gonna reverse the earlier entry. And in this case, if we look back at our numbers, we're gonna assume that she quits on January 1st of year four. So let's see, January one of year one to January one of year two, year three, year four. So she worked for three years for us and then lost those options. So $1,500 a year, it's been three years. So we've recorded that compensation expense three times. And we're going to undo it. We'll just reverse the entries. And the description here is to record what we call unvested options. That's the formal term. That means they lost them by leaving the company. The last possibility is that the options expire. And as sad as it is when people lose them because they quit, it's even worse when they can't get the $8,000 together or they forget to get the $8,000 together and they lose the options because they never use them. The rule with expired options is we can't reverse the compensation expense. They earned these, they just didn't get them. So we can't credit compensation expense. We also can't leave that $6,000 in additional paid in capital stock options outstanding because they're not outstanding anymore. They're gone, they're expired. So we're gonna get out of additional paid in capital stock options outstanding and in this case all six thousand dollars went in there 
I can't credit compensation expense. I can't put it into common stock because the shares never got issued. What I do instead is I create a new additional paid in capital account and I call it expired stock options. Record expired options. Now, once this goes into this additional paid in capital expired stock options, it's going to stay there because there's no way to get it out. Nobody can buy them and get them out. I can't wave away these stock options that were granted and, and uh, weren't used because the people did earn them. So what most companies do is they keep this account on their books. And when they build their balance sheet, they lump it together with additional paid in capital common stock. And they just report one net number with the two values in it. Essentially, what's happening is the employees have worked, they earned the money, and instead of getting that benefit, they gave it back to the owners by not taking it. So what happens as far as my deferred taxes go with all of these three options? With the expiration and the loss, all that happens is my deferred tax account goes to zero. Wherever it was, it goes to zero because they're not going to be used. So they simply go away. I never get the tax break. I just pull it out of deferred taxes with a credit and I debit income tax expense and I show that higher income tax expense in the year that they lose it or that they expire. The only time it really affects my taxes is up in my exercise where it actually becomes a tax credit. So let's take a look at that. This is the tax effects of the equity options when they're exercised. And we start out with our T account. So you remember we got down to year four, we recognize this deferred tax asset. Now that I've used them, then that deferred tax asset has to go to zero because I've used them and I've gotten the tax break. So I need a credit to deferred taxes. So here's my journal entry. There's the credit of $1,800 to deferred taxes. It also gives me a tax break this year. So this time, instead of changing income tax expense, I get to change income tax payable. Now, where did that 2100 come from? That's usually the next question people ask. So let me break that down. First, we need to know the market price and the strike price. Now, the strike price was given to us. It was $8 a share. For the market price, we were told, if we go back to the original slide, that it was $15 a share on the day she exercised the options. I take the difference between these two seven dollars a share times the number of shares and that's a thousand so my actual tax credit is seven thousand dollars my tax rate we've assumed has stayed constant at thirty percent so i'm just going to keep that seven thousand times thirty percent is twenty one hundred and this is really a permanent difference I thought I was going to get a tax break of 1800 It really was 2100 What do I do with that? Well, I put it into additional paid in capital, common stock. If it had come out at less, I would reduce additional paid in capital, common stock. So again, I created this deferred tax set with my best guess on what she'd make, six bucks a share. If it's different than that, when she actually uses the option, then I put the difference into additional paid in capital, common stock. Why? because that's where all of the plug went for the use of these options. We showed the $3,000 in common stock. Everything else that we get from selling this stock to her at the lower price goes into additional paid in capital common stock. In this case, we got the $8,000 from her. She worked for us and earned $6,000. So that becomes part of additional paid in capital. And she also saved us some money with our income taxes. So that gets lumped in to additional paid in capital as well. That takes care of our discussion of equity options. We've gone through all of the journal entries required, not only for the actual issuance of the options and the exercise loss and expiration of the options, but we also took some time and looked at the deferred tax effects of the options, which was kind of cool to look at now that we know how that works. But we need to still talk about our liability options. We'll be doing that next. We'll see you then.